Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Talks at Google event. Stephen Kultai is an entrepreneur. He is currently a guest scholar at the Brookings Institution and managing director of the entrepreneurship consultancy Kultai & Co. Earlier in his career, he founded a number of companies in addition to working in both investment banking and the entertainment industry. From 2009 to 2011, he created and ran the Global Entrepreneurship Program at the US Department of State while serving as the first senior advisor for entrepreneurship under Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Stephen, welcome to Google. I'm going to go very quickly because um, there's a lot to talk about and I want there to be mostly conversation. So I'm going to very quickly run through uh, the presentation and then um, we'll have a chance to chat. Um, I. Uh, uh, it, it came to do this book and ca come to do this work from um, a very personal place. Um, I uh, was uh, uh, born in Budapest in 1954. My parents were survivors of the Holocaust as children. We escaped from Hungary in 1956, the year of the Hungarian Revolution, and came to the United States. So we're migrants or refugees. Um, and. Um, I, uh, throughout my life, uh, have been very much um, uh, formed by those experiences. And the, the, one of the most significant things about it is that I have a very acute sense of how important the political order is and how badly things can go wrong and what disastrous effects they have. For, you know, a, uh, if a tr typical American, if there's such a thing anymore, probably not, um, very often Americans don't have a good sense of history, they don't have a good sense of politics, and they don't understand what happens when things go really wrong. Um, some of you may, and I certainly did. And so I've always had this interest in uh, peace and what are the key um, risks to peace. And throughout my, my schooling, I, I went to Tufts and to the Fletcher School at Tufts and, uh, and, and you know, spent some time um, in a, a couple of think tanks, the Council on Foreign Relations. But most of my life was spent in the private sector. I'm from Los Angeles. I worked in the entertainment industry for half of my career. I was at Warner Brothers for a decade um, I was head of strategy and then head of the interactive uh, entertainment division. We were the first to, to have online shows, um, so I'm very, very connected to, to the internet and all things web. Um, and then I re you know, retired after selling my last company and moved to Maine. And um, then President Obama gave the Cairo speech in uh, June of 2009. And President Obama talked about entrepreneurship in the service of foreign policy. And so that was the first time a president of the United States had ever talked about a subject that had been very much on my mind for you know 25 or 30 years. I left Maine, went to Washington, um, spent the first year in a program called the Franklin Fellows, which, were, which was basically volunteering for free at the State Department, and started this program called the Global Entrepreneurship Program, whose, whose original purpose was uh, job creation through entrepreneurship in Muslim-majority countries. Um, I worked in eight countries, three where we had full-blown programs, which were Egypt, Indonesia, and Turkey in that order of rollout, and then five secondary countries, which were Lebanon, Jordan, Algeria, Tunisia, and Morocco. And um, I uh, learned an incredible amount about what works and what's not working. And I eventually left, uh, started uh, my, my own consulting firm, which I still have in this business, as Marin mentioned. And I also wrote this book. So the book is basically um, follows the same outline as this presentation does. Um, and um, uh, you know, I, I, I want to just start by saying, of all of the things that are important about entrepreneurship, for me, there's a straight line connection between entrepreneurship, jobs, stability, and peace. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about you know, that a lot. But before we get into the details, let me just give you my definition of entrepreneur and entrepreneurship, uh, because it, it informs the entire conversation. For me, an entrepreneur is a person with the vision to see a new product or process and the ability to make it happen. And there are two things that are a little bit nuanced in this definition that are very important. One is it's a product or process, which means that I am as interested in no tech, 
low-tech and high-tech entrepreneurs who sometimes do process innovations, which is what Starbucks is, um, as product innovation. And particularly when you're in Silicon Valley and you're talking you know, in, in the heart of sort of tech entrepreneurship, in, in my world, which works mostly in developing countries, it's extremely important, particularly if your goal is job creation, that you recognize that often the largest number of jobs are not created by tech companies, they're created by no tech or low tech. So if you ignore that part of the definition, you're ignoring the biggest share of job creation. And the second thing I talk about a lot, um, which will not be uh, new news to you, but was new news to everyone in Washington, was that an entrepreneur doesn't just have the vision, but actually is able to make it happen. And frankly, making it happen is more important than the vision. So it's the 95% inspiration, 5% uh, inspiration, 95% perspiration. And everybody in the Valley knows it's about execution, but not everybody, particularly in government, knows that. And there's a sense in government that if we get the policy right, we're there. And I'm here to tell you that's not true. And that wasn't true uh, in my experience there as well. So in the United States, I don't have to tell you, entrepreneurs are rock stars. Um, they're the you know, fighter pilots of our era. They're very famous people. This is not true almost anywhere else in the world. Everywhere else in the world, entrepreneurs are much more like the crabgrass that grows up in the cracks in the pavement between the garbage and the broken glass that starved for air and water and light. And they are not sexy. They are not glamorous. They are the scrubbiest people there are. And in most countries, and I know just by the virtue of the fact you showed up for this, that all of you know what I'm talking about and have had experience abroad. In most countries, the worst thing you could tell your parents if you are a bright, young, successful, about to go someplace important person is, hey, mom and dad, I'm starting my own company. Right? I just graduated from the school, you sent me away to fancy education, and I'm not joining the, the foreign ministry, I'm not joining McKinsey, I'm not joining G Goldman Sachs, I'm starting my own company in the garage. This would be very bad news. So it's a very different culture around entrepreneurship in um, the developing world. Why is it important uh, to America and particularly to American foreign policy? Well. Um, I, I, I have a chapter in the book, and there are books at the back there that Google has been nice enough to supply to you, so you can all take one. Um, there's a chapter in the book called A Million Reasons Entrepreneurship is Good for You, and don't worry, I'm not going to do a million, but I am going to do a, a baker's dozen, and I'm only going to talk about a couple of these. But I, I want you to just see some of the reasons why it's so important. Jobs clearly is the most important uh, and, the, and, and the first one of these that I, that I want to mention, um, and we will talk about that some more. But there are lots of other benefits uh, of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurs are the essential bridge over which innovation is commercialized. Uh, entrepreneurship promotion drives a whole bunch of other positive public policy things like education, like intellectual property protection, like a favorable regulatory environment, frankly, like migration policies immigration policies. So there are a whole bunch of things that we don't normally think of as being associated with promoting entrepreneurship that are sort of ancillary benefits. Um, and, uh, but, the, but the key one is, is definitely jobs. So you know, joblessness to me is um, the single biggest problem that drives violence and failed states around the world. And when we talk about the threats to America today, they tend not to be from other countries, although that may be changing, um, but they tend to be from non-state actors. And those non-state actors are usually fueled by people who have come out of desperate um, uh, situations. And you all know that you know, the youth unemployment rate in the Muslim world is, um, in the Arab world specifically, is the highest of any region. Though I, I like to include Molenbeek on this slide because there is a, a prejudice that this is only an Arab or Muslim issue, which is not the case. The fact of the matter is that um, unempl youth unemployment drives terrorism and failed states wherever it exists. And that is true in Molenbeek, which is a suburb of Brussels, which is where the terrorists who blew up the airport came from. In 1932, in Germany, uh, there was a 24% unemployment rate, uh, which was the year that the Nazi uh, party first won its first election. So 
Um, it's, it is not unique to Muslims or Arabs. It is universally true in, in every part of the world. It was true, for example, in Colombia. Uh, and in the book, I talk about several other examples where, where this is also the case. So the fact is that we need to give people jobs in order to give them hope, and particularly young people. And for all of you who have spent some of your life in a developing country, or at least traveled there, you know that there is nothing more demoralizing, more desperate than the sense that a 22-year-old will never, ever have a job. You will never find a way to support yourself or your family. And so we have to give people a reason to live for rather than to die for, and which is a quote from uh, one of my heroes, uh, Ahmed Al-Alfi, who's an Egyptian-American entrepreneur and who I worked with very closely in Cairo in the first program that I started. But there are a couple of other really important reasons entrepreneurship is, is important. One is that, um, you know, I worked for Hillary Clinton, so I learned a lot about women and girls and the importance of women and girls in the economy, the multiplier effect of women and girls, which I really didn't know much about until I had that experience. And what, one of the things I learned is that for many people not born to privilege, particularly women and girls, but also others not born to privilege, entrepreneurship is often the only way up. So um, it becomes extremely important um, to that group of people. The other thing that I learned that was really interesting, which isn't, wasn't intuitive to me at all, is that entrepreneurs are the same person everywhere in the world. So whether you are in you know, Boston or Bombay or Baghdad or Barbados, they're the same person. They are a bridge class of people. They understand each other wherever they are. They are interested in the same things wherever they are. And in all of the traveling I've done, I've worked in about three dozen countries now, starting with those first eight, um, I have never had a conversation where somebody has started the conversation saying, you know, tell me about American foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Sunni insurgency. Rather, what they say to me, because they know that I'm, you know, Jewish and from Los Angeles and lived in Israel for a year, the Arab entrepreneurs that I met in the neighboring states, in the West Bank, in Gaza, in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Egypt, they all said to me, could you invite us to some r r neutral third place like DC where we could meet Israeli entrepreneurs and VCs because we can see them, but we can't talk to them. And they couldn't care less about the politics. So this was extremely important. And it was particularly important um, when you recognize that this power of entrepreneurship has fueled um, incredible economic success in a variety of places. My, one of my favorite examples I cite in the book is um, Singapore and Jamaica. Singapore and Jamaica were exactly the same size in 1965. They were both British colonies. They were both islands. They had the same number of people. They had almost identical per capita income. That's not true today. And I won't say that entrepreneurship is the only reason, but it certainly was a key core element of economic policy consistently applied for 50 years in Singapore. And there are other places as well. I give the example of Rwanda in the book. Rwanda arguably was the most destroyed society, certainly in the 20th century. At the end of the genocide 21 years ago, the average age in Rwanda was 12. Um, 70% uh, of the men between 18 and 40 were dead. 75% of the women were HIV infected. And there were two medical doctors in the country. Today, Rwanda has had the greatest increase in its per capita income of any country in sub-Saharan Africa. It reflected in part by the fact that it has also had the, the biggest jump in its ranking of, of, of World Bank indicators of doing business. I, I just want to ask a question to both Singapore Rwanda. So the question is, both Singapore and Rwanda, coincidentally or not, are autocratic nations. What bearing does that have on this subject of entrepreneurship? And it's a, obviously um, a true statement, and it does have a bearing. Not so much that autocracy works, but that government uh, uh, leading uh, the policy works. And I will talk about that in other examples as well, like Israel, um, and like, frankly, the United States. So there are examples of non-autocratic states where entrepreneurship was still at the center of, of, of policy, um, but your point is very well taken, and it is true. 
governance matters. Um, so given all these benefits, given the fact that entrepreneurship is in the DNA of America, right? Um, presumably, we are um, you know, doing this a lot. And um, the answer is um, not so much. 1% um, of the 1% that we spend of development assistance goes for entrepreneurship support programs. Um, we are, um, depending on which data you use, and putting this graph together was probably one of the most difficult parts of writing this book. Um, but you know, we are somewhere between five, six, seven, or eight in terms of what we spend on entrepreneurship. We're almost exactly equal with Australia, which has 23 million people is an island nation 15 hours from everywhere, and um, has one 25th the GNP that the United States does. So that's who we're on par with. And we're way behind places like Germany and the Netherlands. Um, so that's the beginning of the second part of the book, which is what are the problems? Well, the problems are we don't spend enough money. The problems are that the money we do spend is very, very poorly organized, so there are 60 different offices in 12 different agencies, in 12 different departments, with um, 23 different agencies all working in this space. And I can tell you, having worked at the State Department, even within the same agency, the State Department, they will go to great lengths not to work with each other. So it's a very, very fractured um, uh, landscape. <clears throat> and the one agency that spends the most money doing this is USAID, which, about which a great deal has been written about how broken it is and how many issues it has. I talk about a lot of them in the book, but, but the, the main issue I talk about is that when, when you talk about entrepreneurship and startups, um, USAID is the last place that is likely to uh, hire a contractor um, who is a small entrepreneurial venture. Um, one third of USAID's $35 billion budget goes to the same three companies. 75% of USAID's budget goes to the same 20 companies. So contracting is the way the US government implements its programs. Today, over 60% of US government programs are carried out not by US government employees, but by outside contractors. US government procurement running at $600 billion makes the US government the largest buyer of goods and services in the economy. And the way we buy those goods and services is, is, is using what I call a rubber screwdriver. It doesn't work anymore. The ability of the contracting system to result in picking the right contractor is almost uh, always now um, a mismatch. I, I wrote a blog for Brookings about healthcare.gov. You know, we're, we're at Google, your programmers. Um, healthcare.gov, you all know better than I do, was not that complicated uh, a, a program to write, right? 20 variables. So on an average, you know, weekday morning, most of you in this room probably do more sophisticated stuff. Why did healthcare.gov not work? Why did it almost torpedo the entire healthcare reform program, which regardless of how you feel about it, everyone agrees it's one of the most significant public policy events that's happened in America in the post-war era. Why did the fact that the website didn't work become the single biggest issue? The reason is it's because of the way the contract was led. The company who won the contract, who is by the way Canadian, won the contract on top of an existing contract that it had, because had there been a new contract created, it would have taken three years to hire anyone. So the only way to get around that was to add to an existing contract for a totally different subject. And then hope that they found someone as a subcontractor to them who would be able to do it. Well, it didn't work out that way. The fact that the company who won the contract had no ability to execute on the contract and do that work was irrelevant in awarding the contract. That's a problem. And that's a problem in everything we do, and specifically in the world that I worked in, in um, entrepreneurship and innovation, it's a problem. Doubly so because it is the smallest, most innovative companies that are likely to be the ones who are going to be most interesting to work in the entrepreneurship space. 
So it's, it's what I call a mouse dancing with a hippo problem. A small, innovative company has zero ability to work with the government. They won't even be able to apply, much less win, much less manage the contract. So what should we be doing? Well, we need to turn this effort of you know, uh, uh, the, the lone sapling, which is the greatest job creator and one of the greatest stabilizers of societies from being this lone sapling into a garden. And there are several ways to do that. I have developed one particular way, and I don't for a moment say it's the only way or even necessarily the best way. But I uh, have come up with this thing called the <clears throat> six plus six model for entrepreneurship ecosystem building. Um, it's described in the book, and it basically says that there are six categories of activity and six categories of player that have to be involved in moving the needle in an ecosystem. You can't just start a venture fund. You can't just build a, bink, a business incubator. You can't just start an angel investor group. You can't just run a business plan competition. You can't just run a tech camp and expect any of those things individually to necessarily move the needle. You have to do a combination of things. So in the work that I do in the field, that's what we do. We do a three-step process, diagnostic design and implementation, and we come up with a package of programs specific to a particular economy that takes account of where they're strong and where they're weak, and then tries to supplement those through programs. That's, that's basically um, the kind of consulting we do. We start with a diagnostic. This is one that we did in Ghana for the UK government. So we landscaped the Ghanaian ecosystem and we looked for where there were holes or weaknesses. And then we developed a program. Why should government be the ones who do this? Well, government should be the ones who do this because, and I was talking to a couple of folks beforehand, you know, Google for Entrepreneurs is, is, is a sort of a, a poster child example of a great company doing great work in this space. And there are others as well. Not enough, but there are. The problem is that there are things that are the responsibility of government. Private companies, like Google, are understandably interested in developing markets, inter interested in developing new tech-related products. They're interested in the best ideas wherever they may come from. That is a different interest than the political interest of wanting to create jobs in the world's most violent and troubled places. Different agenda. That, to me, is why government is necessary. Government needs to be involved where no man has gone before. I'm sort of a trekker because I'm old, so I really like this new postage stamp. Um, so there are four ways to solve the problem. Funding, organization, procurement, and people. In the book, I end with recommendations for the future. Increase the amount of money we spend. One of the points that I, I make is that, um, you know, the, the book is called Investing in Entrepreneurship for, for, for Security and Development. And I emphasize security because we spend so much money on security. Four trillion dollars in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Pakistan since the Bush Wars began. In that time, um, 60,000 people have died. Uh, 60,000 Allied troops, including Americans, have, di have died. 250,000 local military have died. And seven million people have been displaced, including many who are in the process of destabilizing the European Union. And the youth unemployment rate is about one and a half times what it was when we got there. So if you take the view that I have, which is that it is youth unemployment that is the number one driver of political unrest, instability, and violence, how much better off are we having spent that $4 trillion today than if we would have spent a rounding error of that on job creation programs through entrepreneurship. So to me, it's about increasing spending by moving it from some programs that aren't working, both within the Pentagon and USAID, into programs that are. It's about doing entrepreneurship more effectively at, at, at a political level, and I won't bore you guys with the, the bureaucracy and how it needs to be reorganized to do that. It's about creating a new contracting mechanism for, for, for smaller entrepreneurial companies to at least get a toehold in working in this space. If there's any place that we're going to innovate procurement and contracting, what better place to innovate than in the category of innovation? So that seems to me to be a good place to start. And the last thing, which is kind of self-serving, is that people like you and people like me who have experience in the private sector, 
in the entrepreneurial space don't work in government. And it is very difficult to get a career civil servant or foreign service officer who has never worked outside of the womb to understand what it means to deliver a product on time, on budget, who understands, you know, I have a passage in the book about how somebody almost fired me. I was actually almost fired on several occasions, which was hard to do since I was a volunteer. But still, um, there was somebody who said to me when I said, you know, we have a big problem. I have an answer. Here's the answer. It's the workaround, and it's going to solve the problem. And the person got up out of their chair, and I was sitting down, and came over and looked over me and said, this is the State Department. We don't do workarounds. And I said, you know, I had this little dialogue bubble that formed over my head thinking, what would all of our lives be like if we never did workarounds, right? So um, that's why I, I wrote the book. It's why I'm so passionate about this. And it's why I appreciate any help any of you can give, not only in the conversation, but in helping to spread the word um, about this concept. Thanks for listening. So I wanted to go back to one of your earlier slides um, in, in this presentation. You, you reference Peruvian economist Hernando de Soto a lot in your book. And, and one of those is in reference to, to economic hope and the importance um, of economic hope in battling terrorism. And I wondered if you might discuss that a little bit more and then how entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial efforts do provide this economic hope. Well, you know, um, Hernando de Soto, of course, is Peruvian. And he um, grew up and developed many of his theories during Peru's terrible political, violent political crises uh, related to the Shining Path movement, the revolution there. And so um, Peru, which is not a Muslim country and not Arab, had exactly the same issues, which is that there were large numbers of permanently unemployed, despairing youth who had no other opportunity for ever advancing. And surprise, surprise, that led to a violent civil war for many years. And that informed Hernando de Soto's um, studies and his conclusions. And so to me, the fact that there is, and, and, and in the book I cite many other examples, but there is really ample evidence to show that um, it is that joblessness that's the root of despair. Then the question becomes, how do we know that entrepreneurship is the best way to address that joblessness? Well, that again, um, I talk in the book about research from the Kauffman Foundation, which is the best funded research organization devoted to just studying entrepreneurship. The Kauffman Foundation um, found that from 1985 to 2005, um, uh, all of the net job growth in the United States occurred in uh, small and medium-sized businesses, basically startups less than five years old. And in 2007, which was outside of that window, um, they did the study again, and they found that not all, only 12 million of 15 million jobs. So however you slice it, if you look at and there's lots and lots of data about this. The largest employer in, in the world is always the public sector. And the next largest employer um, on, a, on, a, on an ongoing basis is our, our businesses that are, that, are, that are begun by entrepreneurs. So, and particularly if you take out of that resource extraction. Um, so there's, there's very little um, question from a, a hard evidence standpoint that entrepreneurship is, if not the biggest driver, one of the biggest drivers of job creation. And you also, you also make the point, and I think this is something that we um, in the Bay Area maybe forget, I certainly do, is that entrepreneurship is, is tech agnostic. And although Silicon Valley is certainly a shining star as far as entrepreneurship goes, it's not the only successful place. And so, um, you know, what, can you discuss a little bit the, the importance of, of that tech agnosticism and what that means throughout the world? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm glad you asked because I, I feel really strongly about it, even though my own background was also tech, um, it, tele, media telecommunication. Um, you know, uh, quinoa, 
Uh, quinoa uh, was about a $35 million a year industry. Um, it's today about a $3 billion a year industry. And it's the same quinoa that the Incas ate 1,500 years ago. It is completely unchanged. It has not been gen genetically modified. Um, so what happened? What happened was process entrepreneurs. What happened was marketing, distribution, branding, and that's what grew it a hundredfold or a thousandfold. And I can give you dozens of other examples. Now, by the way, quinoa is also an important example because guess what? It's a pretty labor intensive product. And it's a labor intensive product that actually is grown by some of the very poorest people in the poorest countries, like Peru, by the way. So it gave people an income that otherwise would not have had it. So had the industry not grown, had there not been an entrepreneur who realized that this could become a much bigger product, that ripple effect benefit would never have accrued. I'd like to pivot a little bit to discussing, you know, the America and the, you talk a lot about the, the disconnect between America and Washington and how, you know, there are so many American entrepreneurs and that just doesn't, doesn't quite make it to the government. Um, and, you know, there's even, you even have a quote about how companies, and you reference Google, uh, and I'm not sure if this was your quote or uh, a reference, but that companies have more influence in the Middle East and Africa than the Department of State in a lot of cases. And so how, you know, what does this mean? How can we improve on this? Well, I do, uh, it was my quote about Google. Um, during the Tower Square uprising, um, our program, which started in, in Cairo and which had a significant boost from the local Google country office there, um, we were able to communicate through our own social media with more people, mostly young entrepreneurs in Cairo, than the State Department was through all of its collective um, listservs. So when the US government wanted to get a message out to the young people who were demonstrating in Tower Square who were disproportionately, by the way, entrepreneurs, um, it was our uh, connection through Google which actually proved to be more uh, efficient than, than other sources. You know, the, the, the fact is that, um, and I skipped over it very quickly, but you probably saw that even in the places that hate us the most, in which there are unfortunately now a lot, the one thing that people respect about the United States is our culture of entrepreneurship. And everywhere you go, um, that is true. And all, as, like I said at the beginning, every person in this room ha has international experience. You've all traveled, and I'm sure you've all experienced this yourselves firsthand. It's, a, it's an amazing conversation starter, and it's an amazing bridge to people. Um, and it is because of companies like this that that exists. So they, they, you, have a unique ability if you want to use it. In the case of Google, you do and you are. But Google is, is unfortunately a little too unique. I mean, I wish Google did more proselytizing around its own community to get more people to do this kind of work that you do. Um, so there are places where these kinds of companies have a role. And then, as I said, there are places where the US government has a role and that are outside, legitimately outside, of the purview of a private company. What do you see as the role of government in entrepreneurship? It's, it's easy to look at it as, well, you know, there's, it's completely separate. And so how, how, do, how does government, how does entrepreneurship, how does this come together? Well, I have a couple of case studies in the book, including the US and Israel and Rwanda and Chile. And I talk about the fact that there's no example of a country in the world that has a successful entrepreneurial ecosystem, including this one, which was not led by the government. Not only that the government was involved, but it was led by the government. By far and away, the largest share of R&D spending in all of the industries, including the one that gave birth to Silicon Valley, came from the government. Now, there's a point at which the government then backs away or moves to the next category, but private investors tend to look for quarterly returns, 
when the time of the return is, de is separated you know, by a long time horizon from the point of investment, that's no longer an area that private capital is going to invest in. If you're telling me that an investment today is going to pay off in 20 years, I'm not interested. Governments need to be interested. And governments need to recognize that the problems that, that for example, plague the United States today, terrorism, for instance, did not happen overnight. They developed over time, and the solution would have also developed over time. So government, and one of the things in the work that I do now is, if, if I work in a, in a country, and I just finished a project for the World Bank in 10 Caribbean countries working with 10 different business incubators, and I knew the minute I got there that there were a couple of those countries where there was no one in government who cared, there was no champion in government who cared, and it wasn't going to work. So the first thing we do when we do a diagnostic is identify the champion in government. It could be in the tech ministry, which it often is. It could be education. It could be women. It could be in a number, ministry of industry. It could be in a number of places. I get really excited when it's the prime minister. Um, but if you don't, if you can't identify that person, the prognosis is bleak from the get-go. And you discussed the, the delivery of entrepreneurship programs and, and finding that person. What can, what can we do you know, as employees of Google, as, as people living in the United States? What, I, I feel like just, just one person, what can I do? Wonderful question. And there are a lot of things you can do. Um, so as a business person, let me just start practically. Um, number one, all of you have networks. So helping to spread the word about this is hugely important. I'm, I'm, I, I like speaking to different groups. I'm doing it not because I think this is ever going to be the world's biggest bestseller, although that would be nice, um, but it's because I really believe passionately that this is something we have to do. And I know from being in Washington that the change must come from Congress. That means a nationwide campaign. That means there has to be a viral uprising of people to say we've got to do something differently than bomb everybody back to the Stone Age. There has to be a better way to deal with this than anonymous drone strikes. So helping to spread the word is one thing. Second is to the extent that any of you have time, I don't have to tell you how important you are and how important you know, your work is um, as a role model for others. In, in the work I do in, in entrepreneurship development, the single most important factor in a successful entrepreneur, especially in a developing country, is mentorship. And I always am looking for mentors, particularly with language abilities. So if you speak something other than English only, I'm especially interested. Um, and I have, you know, I can use you for an hour, I can use you for 100 hours. I mean, we can find some way to make it work. It can be all virtual. It can be Skype. It can be remote mentoring. And for those of you who actually are interested, I, the way my, my own operation works is I, I work exclusively by hiring people on a consulting contract basis specific to a geography, which includes understanding that country, understanding that culture, understanding that language. So if you ever have time or interest or you want to do something in this space, um, you know, I'm one of the people who, who would love to hear from you. Wonderful. I would like to turn it over to audience questions, if there are any. And I, I'll bring the mic around if anyone has any questions. Uh, I'm from Colombia. So yesterday, Colombia signed uh, a peace treaty with uh, for the uh, longest uh, guerrilla that uh, this part of the world had. And um, it's still like, I kind of, like a lot uh, the title of your book and but my thinking right now is that even though the Colombian people still deciding whether to vote yes or no for that treaty um, most of the reasons for the no are coming from how do we like corruption it's even worse than uh, what we kind of finish with uh, with the FARC so do you have any advice or any practical tips on how to deal with moving the government internally? Because everything you just said, it's good. And I think us in the startup ecosystem kind of understand it more. But then 
working with the government inside is just like not feasible from my point of view. So do you have like tips or? So in the book, I talk about the fact that the single biggest obstacle in my experience to entrepreneurship um, is number one, culture, and number two, corruption. There's not a single country that I work in where corruption is not at the top of the list of problems, which is why I use the image of the crabgrass or the seedling growing up through the cracks in the concrete. Because the people who survive are the ones who've made it through all of that. And you will know that even in the worst environments, there are such people. So one of the programs I have, just as a, to make this a little more real, is I do a, an entrepreneurship journalism training program where I bring somebody who covers startups in both digital or uh, print media to train local journalists in the country how to find their own entrepreneurs and write about them. Because telling the story of local entrepreneurs who've been successful in Colombia or Ghana or Egypt or Indonesia is infinitely more impactful than telling them about Larry Page or Mark Zuckerberg, who they immediately dismiss and say, well, yeah, I could do that too if I lived in Mountain View. But you know, if you live you know, in, 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 in Colombia, now the fact is, Colombia is, is one of my most favorite examples right now of how super critical this is. Because Colombia, like Tunisia, by the way, is at a tipping point. Colombia has gotten a second chance. It can go away very easily. It can all go back very easily. Tunisia can very easily become Libya. And one of the things that makes the difference of the tipping point is if you can start to build the ecosystem, it is those people who drive the government to better governance. It is those young people who say, look, you want me to stay and create jobs? Fine. This is what you have to do. If you don't do those things, I'm going to San Jose, uh, uh, California. Um, so I'm not, uh, you know, the, the, the one thing that even repressive governments have in common with democratic governments is they are all afraid of hordes of unemployed young people. No government likes a lot of unemployed young people. It is always bad for their longevity. So you can use the argument that, okay, it's a new day, and I'm going to help, you know, I, I, I work at Google, so I'm not there full time, but I'm prepared to help mentor, um, you know, a, a group of people um, who, you know, I might meet with or talk to or Skype with once a week, and we might have our kind of a virtual meetup. Um, or whatever it may be, to try to grow that constituency of people within the country because they are the ones who will keep the government honest. They are the ones who will drive the reform from inside. Driving it from the outside, having the US or the UN or somebody else come with a hammer and beat it up and down on your head and tell you you need to change your IP laws because people are ripping off American computer software and movies, that doesn't work. When local entrepreneurs say, I'm going to leave. If I don't have any way to protect this you know, patent, why should I stay here? I'm going to go someplace where I can protect it. You know, I work in Ghana. Well, the largest number of Ghanaian entrepreneurs are Nigerian. And that's because Nigeria doesn't have those safeguards. So Nigeria, which is by far the largest country in Africa, is unable to hang on to its own entrepreneurs because there's a slightly better, and Ghana is not California, but it's a hell of a lot better than Nigeria, and that's where they go. And the same thing will happen you know, in, in Colombia. If it doesn't work in Colombia, they'll go to Panama. It's not that far away, and they can go to Panama. Do you think there's such a thing as being ready for entrepreneurs or ready for entrepreneurship? Do countries or regions need to be ready, or is it always possible? You know, I love that question because it, um, it reminds me of the first country I worked in, Egypt. So um, I had a big fight with the USAID mission chief there 
eventually there was a new one who was the one who supported my program, actually, um, who I think is a saint and who, who I talk about in the book, um, Hilda Ariano. But the previous one said, you know, Egypt is not ready for entrepreneurship. Egypt is still at the place where they need um, drinking water, where they have a very high infant mortality rate, where they have you know, waterborne diseases, where they need housing. So Egypt is at the base of the pyramid, so to speak, if you pardon the expression, and needs to use, and need, we, we need to, 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 to do pure <coughs> assistance. Um, emergency assistance. And I said, I'm not going to invoke the teach a man to fish versus give him a fish analogy because I know everyone already knows that. But time and again, and Haiti is a great example, we go in and we provide emergency relief and then we leave. So now you have people who live in tents and have a week, a month, six months worth of drinking water and their immediate wounds are bandaged up, and we leave, and they stay. What are they going to do? So for me, there is no such thing as a country has not reached the state of development where entrepreneurship is appropriate. To me, it is not a consecutive exercise. It's a simultaneous exercise. Of course you have to provide disaster relief. Of course, if Nepal is hit by an earthquake, you have to dig the people out from the rubble and provide tents. But as soon as they are living in tents, you should be providing entrepreneurship education. As soon as people are living in displaced persons camps in Germany or in Greece from the Middle East, what are they doing there? They can't work. They're not allowed to leave. You know, what should we be doing with them? We should have, you know, a little incubator set up in one of the tents, which is one of the programs I'm actually trying to persuade someone to fund, um, specifically related to European, uh, to the migrants in Europe, exactly for that reason. The people who made it there are among the cream of the crop. If you were, if you were clever enough and smart enough and you survive, you know, the survival of the fittest and you made it there, you were probably an unusually good candidate to be an entrepreneur. So, I don't buy the argument that entrepreneurship um, programs only work when countries reach a certain level of development. I think it's, it's, it's good. I think entrepreneurship is good for you all the time. Um, so one of my questions is around, uh, based on what you're saying, a lot of the uh, policies in these, uh, in these uh, markets need to come from the people. But at the same time, uh, the US and as we start to invest in these companies, in these countries, um, we we want to see these policies take hold. So, how do we strike a balance between um, kind of guiding the policies to remove co corruption and, and investment, while also trying to influence um, the actual entrepreneurs on the ground to uh, to to speak their mind and voice their concerns around that? Because that seems to be the one that actually makes the difference. Well, you know. Um uh, it, it, I, I, I have learned in my day-to-day -day work, this didn't come from my research, it just came sort of from my experience on the ground, that um, number one, the United States, while it is uh, only sixth or seventh in entrepreneurship funding, is by far and away, in straight dollar terms, the largest aid donor in the world. Particularly when you include our contributions to the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the African Development Bank, as well as our own. So we have about $100 billion a year. That's a lot of money, even at Google. And it is, gives you uh, credibility to you know, make demands. So one of the things that's very frustrating to me and that I would do differently is the World Bank or USAID doesn't <clears throat> extract enough quid pro quo from the government that it works with in order to receive the aid that they give them. So if you're going to give the Colombian government um, money for a new entrepreneurship program, which you should, part of the deal is the government has to do this, this, and this, which includes something about you know reporting and transparency and metrics. 
I personally would also like to see some sort of, uh, you know, whistleblower, ombudsman, anonymous kind of feedback loop. But the, and, and, and there are all sorts of interesting ideas around that, including, by the way, blockchain, which, which, which government is not able to interrupt. And when you can track transactions <clears throat> through blockchain, in, um, whether they are about assets like land title, which is the most obvious one. It's the one that Hernando de Soto talks about <clears throat> and the one that I'm really excited about to un unleash the trillion dollars in dead capital that developing countries have in their own property because they can't prove they have it and therefore they can't borrow against it. Um, but, but I think that you know, we can and should, a as the US, through these organizations, be much firmer and much more tough love about if you want the money and you want the support, the quid pro quo is that you do this, this, and this, and that we really ride them for that. We don't do that enough. So thank you. Thank you all.